Well, uh, happy Mother's Day to uh, all the moms here today and watching online. Uh, Mother's Day, if you don't know, uh, was officially recognized as a holiday uh, by President Woodrow Wilson back in 1914. But Mother's Day actually started a few years before that by a lady by the name of Anna Jarvis, who wanted to honor her mother uh, and decided, hey, I'm going to go honor my mom at church today. And so, uh, so we do that as a church. Every year we, we set aside this day and then we'll set aside Father's Day to honor our, our parents because after all, if you've read the Ten Commandments, you're supposed to honor your father and mother. So, uh, so we're just following what the Bible says uh, to do in that. And so, um, you know, but it's funny that we relate to moms on different levels, don't we? Like, like, like think about it. When you're four years old, uh, your mom can do anything, can't she? She can do, like, she is a superhero. When, you, when you're 12 years old, you start to think, my mom isn't that smart. When you're 14, you think, my mom doesn't know anything. When you're 18, your mom is way behind the times. When you're 25, now, hold on, I, I should say, I picked those four ages because those are the four ages of my kids. So they're sitting in here so they can relate to those things right now. Because each one of them thought about that when they said, it's like, wait a minute, I'm 12, I'm 14, I'm 18, I'm uh, the four-year-old. He probably doesn't, he's just, he's just here. But when you're 25, you start to think, my, my mom kind of knows some things. When you're 35, you, you start calling your mom and say, I need to get my mom's opinion on this. When you're 45, you start to think, I wonder what my mom would say. And then you become 65 and you start to think, I wish... I could call my mom one more time. You see, I understand that today is is also a difficult day for many. Many of us whose mom isn't here anymore and we're celebrating uh, Mother's Day maybe for the first time without our mother or maybe you struggle with infertility and you long to be a mom and that is your dream just to be a mom and and so today brings back reminders of of that, that, that you're not a mom yet. And so today, what I want you to do, whether that's you're in that boat or you've, you've lost your mom or your mom's here today with you, I want to encourage you today to celebrate your mother. Celebrate all the good things that, that she did for you, that she's done for you. Celebrate it uh, mainly because literally the number one reason we wouldn't be here without our moms, right? Like if you think about it, like literally you could not be here without your mother. But another reason... I think you need to celebrate your mom and I need to celebrate my mom is because at one time in your mom's life, she was normal. If I have a weird mom in here, come on. If you're sitting next to her, just raise your hand. You know it. Come on. You know why she's weird? You. She's weird because it's, because think about this. Look, I'm telling you, listen, look, and, and, and um, moms, you can probably relate to this. Before you had kids, you'd have never taken your, your finger and stuck it in a diaper, right? To, to check if there was something in there. Like that's, that's weird. That's weird. But, but when you have kids, like that's, that's, that becomes the normal thing. Like you're just like, oh, you got a dirty diaper? Let me check. Let me stick my finger. In. Like, you're like, what? Come on. But, but in all seriously, uh, seriousness, um, I, w- I want to honor moms today uh, because of the, uh, all, all the in- incredibly hard tasks that they accomplish each and every day. Uh, and I also want to say that um, moms have an incredibly diff- difficult job. Um, I want to honor my mom today. She's not here. She'll probably watch this later on this afternoon. She doesn't live here around here. So she's, um, she's I would imagine, at her church today. Um, I want to honor my wife. My wife is sitting right over here and the mother of our four kids I also want to honor my mother-in-law. She, um, she's, I don't think she's here today. I haven't seen her, but uh, I do want to honor her. I have inf- uh, three incredibly godly women uh, in my life uh, each and every day and for my kids. And so today I want to take uh, really quick, I know um, we've got some things to get to at the end of the service today, and I know we have kids in here, so I'm going to try to talk really, really fast today. Uh, but I do want to just kind of hit and honor moms today. And I want to be in the book of 1 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, it's in the Old Testament. Uh, it's, uh, it's a few books in it's, it's, if you get to Ruth, it's the book right after Ruth and first Samuel basically is about men. It's about, uh, Kings and it's about basically three men. It's about Samuel. It's about, um, it's about Saul and it's about David, but I want to look at first Samuel one and I want to give you three things that, that great mothers have. 
So just for a second, men, don't tune me out. If you're not a mom, don't tune me out because, because here's the thing. We can all learn uh, some things from this. We can all learn some things um, about uh, moms today. Because here's what I know. If you study scripture, here's what I know. Um, because scripture, when we talk about scripture, a lot of times when we, when we preach, we, we hype the men, don't we? Like we talk about the men. We talk about uh, Moses. But y'all know that Moses had a great mother. If you don't know that story, uh, Jochebed, who was his mother, uh, when, when um, he was a baby, uh, they were calling for all the men, all the boys to be killed. And she took Moses and put him in a basket and put him in the river to save his life. We talk about King David, right? King David. But he came, uh, the, the lineage of his line came from Ruth, who we just, if you would flip over, you can read it. Uh, I would encourage you to read that. Uh, and then Jesus, right? We always talk about Jesus, but he came from a, uh, from a, a mother, Mary, that was super incredibly uh, obedient to the Holy Spirit. And so we, we want to hype the men, but understand that the men, all the men that we talk about in the, in the Bible, uh, if we trace their line back to their mother, their mother was incredibly godly. And so I want to talk about uh, three things that great mothers have. And the first thing I would tell you today, great mothers have great problems. Can any of them relate to that? Right? Like you're sitting there like, woo, come on, preacher. Like you're like, like this, he's, he's speaking it today. But think of the Bible, because um, I think a lot of times when we think of, of, of the Bible characters, when we talk about those characters, whether they're men or women, we always think of them as squeaky clean, don't we? Like we think, of, we because we, all the stories we've heard in, 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 in Sunday school growing up, we think of them as just squeaky clean Bible, like nothing ever went wrong. Um, but but I, w- I want us to look at some of the problems today that we see a mother uh, some of the, the problem that a mother has uh, in 1 Samuel today. And so we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. And so there was a certain man uh, from Ramathene, a, a Zufite. I wouldn't suggest us uh, trying to pronounce that too many often. But it tells us where it's from. It's from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jerom, uh, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, the son of Zufa, and Ephra, uh, Ephraimite. Whew. I'm glad I got that one out of the way. Uh, He had two wives. It's his first problem. Uh, (laughs) But we're not talking about him today. We're going to talk about uh, one of his wives named Hannah. It says, one was called Hannah and the other, Panana. Uh, Can I just say that uh, we're going to talk about Hannah. And the reason why I think we call and we we name our kids Hannah is because of the story we're going to talk about. But I will say that I've never uh, met someone named Panana. And so, um, and so just take that as you will and learn from that. But, um, but she had uh, children and Hannah had none. Verse three, year after man, year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where uh, Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day uh, for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Panana and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Now, I'm not gonna get into like why, why God did, chose to do that, um, but we understand that the, it plays into the story here. In verse six, because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival, who was the other lady, uh, kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her. To, to, till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than, than 10 sons? Now, quick lesson for men here, okay? That's probably not what you need to uh, say there um, when your wife is, is weeping and crying. Because here's what he was saying. Let me, just, let me just unpack this, what he was saying. I ain't good enough for you? Like he was, I, I would imagine he's like, come on, babe. Like, what are you, why are you weeping? Like, you got me? Like, what else could you want? Right? Look at this. Like he said, I am, look at this physical specimen, baby. You got me. Like, that's, that's not the time to say that. Ever really is the time to say that. But that's really not the time to say that. But that's what he was saying. Like he's telling Hannah, he's like, look at me. Don't you, you got me? Why you want a kid? Like you got, just, just a side note, man. Choose your words wisely. <laughs> Especially when she's weeping, right? 
But let's look at her problems here, right? Let's look at, she's, I said great mothers have great problems, but there's actually two problems here. Number one, you can probably guess it, was her infertility. She, she was infertile. She was unable to have kids. And it says in, in there that, that the Lord closed her womb. And like I said, I don't understand why he, he did that. It's not, we, we don't have the, the written out text to understand why he did that. We just understand that he did. And it says that the Lord closed, and so this was, and this is, look, this is a problem facing like a, a lot of couples today. It's, it, one in, they, they estimate that one in eight couples uh, suffer from some sort of infertility and are, are unable to have uh, kids of their own. And I don't understand that. I don't understand why some are and some aren't. I don't, I'm, I'm not, that's not for me to decide, and, and, and my, I'm not smart enough to get that. But that is one of her problems, that, that one of her great problems, and we see because of that, that it troubled her deeply. Like she was weeping and she was downhearted and she, so much so that she would not eat. That was her first problem. But we see in here she had another problem. And that was her rival who kept provoking her. And I would imagine she just kind of dangled it in front of Hannah and just said, ha, 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 look, I've got all these kids over here and you don't have any. And I imagine women struggling with infertility feel that way sometimes. I don't think women probably maybe dangle it in front of them like, they, like, like maybe this, this situation here, but, but it's, just, it's just there. And they see it all the time. And they're reminded of it. They're constantly reminded of it. And as I told you just a few minutes ago, I, I would encourage you to, to take, take that and, and, and turn like Hannah did towards God. Turn towards God. Because not only that, that we see in this story that great mothers have great problems, but they also have, great mothers have great priorities. Great mothers have great priorities. Let's pick, uh, continue on in the story in verse nine. Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty. Now that Lord Almighty was basically, uh, it, it's a declaration for her to say that you are the God who can do anything. You are the God of anything's possible. She says, Lord Almighty, if you will, only look on your servant's misery, misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son. I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor shall ever be used on his head. Now, if you, if you understand that, that's, that's called a Nazarite vow. Uh, and so that's not the only thing that, um, that, that would have happened in that vow. There's some other things. He, he wouldn't have been allowed to touch alcohol or, um, or, or some other things, but, but the razor to his head, like, um, that was the one main thing that they would not cut their hair. So no razor uh, would go to uh, be on his head. Verse 12, as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Now, here's the problem. I'll stop right there. One of the big problems is when we assume too much a lot of times, don't we? Like, like Eli, who was the priest at that time, so he would have been like me, the pastor, he was assuming that because she was, she was in anguish and weeping bitterly and crying over this, he was assuming that there was something going, I mean, she's, she's kind of off a rocker. Like she's, and so he automatically assumes she's drunk in verse 15, what she says back, not so, my Lord, Anna replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking weir, uh, wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. In verse 17, Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And she, and she went her way, went, then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. And then verse 19, early the next morning, they rose and worshiped before the Lord and went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Now, there, we see some hints in this, in this verse here about her priorities. 
We see some hints throughout this about her priorities and her ongoing relationship with God. It says in there that, that number one, we see that she, she recognized who the Lord Almighty was. I told you that that phrase meant the one who is the God of, of anything's possible is basically what it's saying there when she addresses him as Lord Almighty. So she understands her position. And then verse 12, it said that she kept praying. Now, I don't believe this was like, hey, God, um, I know you can, you know, you can do this and, and you're doing that. But if, if you'd really, if you'd like to, you could give me a son. Like, like no, I, I believe that this was a, a constant, when it says she kept praying, she kept pouring out her heart before God. It was constant. She didn't stop. She just kept going and kept going. And there's depth to this relationship with God. There was depth. There's something, uh, there, there's something inside of, of Hannah that was just saying, I got to keep showing up. I got to keep praying. And it says early the next morning, she had her priorities in, in, in line. Here's the thing that I know if, and if, is that there's something different about a godly mother. Like there's something different about, about a mother who, who prays for their kids. There's something different about their kids too, I'll just say. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said that no one is poor who has a godly mother. And why I think that, that, that women are so important in the church and why ministry towards women and, and are so important and women's small group, small groups are so important um, and why Samuel was so fortunate to have Hannah is because you can't pass on to others what you don't have yourself. You can't pass on to your kids what you don't have yourself. You can't just show up to church once in a while and hope your kids are going to get God. You've got to be able to pass that on through you. Downstairs in our kids' ministry, we've got an illustration. If you walk in and there's some green ping pong balls and there's some orange ping pong balls. And what that illustration basically is, is it tells you um, it's a... It's a it's a picture of how many hours you have with your kids versus how many hours the church has with your kids. And if you go look at that, the green ping pong balls, which are the, the predominant ping pong ball in there, is how many hours you have with your kid. The orange ping pong balls in there are how many hours we have with your kid. And so on average, we have, I think, about 40 hours a year. Is that right? 40 hours a year um, to, to, to minister to your kid. You have over 3,000 hours a year. So put that in perspective, because what we do is we drop kids off at church and we tell them, you teach them about Jesus. You tell them about Jesus. But really, it's, it's our job as parents, because we can't pass on what we don't have. If you look at it in, in lines of an inheritance, if I want to leave my kids a million dollars, I can't leave it to them if I don't have it, right? Fair? And so it's the same thing. I can't pass on to my kids what I don't have first. And Hannah made it a priority, made her relationship with God a, par- a priority. And we see it right here that she's pouring out her heart to her father, to her, to her God. Lastly, I'll tell you this. Great mothers have great plans. Great mothers have great plans. I want to pause right here just a second. And, and I want to tell you, every parent has a plan for their kids, don't you? Right? Like I've got, I've got four kids. Like I've got plans. Can I just, can I just pause right here real quick and say, and this is hard for me to, to, to say and, and understand because I got a daughter that's about to go off to college, but, but God's plans for your kid's life is way better than your plans for your kid's life. But great mothers have great plans. Let's continue on in the story. It says, when her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow. So if you understand this, they had to go to, uh, to, to the temple to offer their, their yearly sacrifice for, for their sins because Jesus had not died yet. So we're, we're, we're pre-crucifixion, uh, death, burial, resurrection. And so you had to go to the priest. You had to uh, slay an animal. And, and that's what uh, got you in right standing with God. So that's what they were going to do. And verse 22, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. Do what, what seems best for you. Now, see, now Elkin has learned, right? He's learned, you go ahead and do what's best for you, right? He's no longer in this attitude of, look what you got, baby. He's, he's like, he's changed it up. He's like, hey, honey, whatever's best for you, you go do it. 
And he says this, uh, he says, stay here until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with her three, uh, three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they, they brought the boy to Eli, and he said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you may live. I am the woman who stood here beside you praying for, uh, to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Now, I want us to understand a little bit deeper on this level of what weaning was in this time. Because we think of weaning, okay, it's probably the first year, and then we're going to, it's a, during this period, weaning, like, we didn't have, a, we didn't have like, like, going to the grocery store to get food. So weaning was probably about a five to seven year process, okay? And, and, and before we start to think that's nasty and gross it wasn't just breastfeeding it was more to it like there was some some things involved in weaning the child and teaching them things it was teaching them uh how to do certain things how, how to worship god and so what, he's, what what hannah was saying is is when i'm done weaning the child and teaching him all he needs to know to to, to be able to live i'm gonna go and sacrifice uh the bull and we're gonna, gonna give him to the lord now they, when they, they did this this meant that hannah said i'm leaving you here She, she didn't take Samuel back home to continue to raise him. She left him at the temple, and she went back home. So when I say that God's plans for your kids' lives are greater than yours, think how hard that was. Samuel was probably five, six, seven, maybe eight years old at that time. She left him there under the care of Eli. But if we, under, if we look and see who Samuel was later on, Like, like Samuel was the guy who God appointed. He was a prophet who God appointed uh, to, to pick out the king. <laughs> Think how important this was. Like Samuel was the guy who not only picked out Saul, but Samuel was the guy who said, you know what, we're going to take this. He was so in tune with God later in life. He said, we're going to take the, the lineage, the heritage of, of the kingship out of the line of Saul's family and give it to the line of David. Understand the significance in that. Like this is who, what, when, when Hannah was saying, I'm committing this child to the Lord. I'm taking him to the temple and I'm going to sacrifice the bull and I'm going to bring the flour and I'm going to bring the wine. And, and, and he's going to learn here. Because she understood, understood that, that God's plan for Samuel's life was so much greater than her plan. And she put all her dreams all her aspirations on the shelf to pour her life out into Samuel. And so Samuel could pour his life out into others. And so I want to give you uh, three quick things real quick, and then we're going we're gonna to move on. Three quick things. Number one, I would tell you this. Women, you are a value to God no matter uh, if, if you are a mother or not. You are a valued to God no matter if you're a mom or not. Your value is not found in if you've birthed a child yet. Your value is found in being a daughter of the king. The second thing, women, when you have pain, God has a plan. When you have pain, God has a plan. Look, being a parent is hard, and there's pain associated with that. And understand, I know my parents could probably, if they were here, they could probably tell you all the things that they were like, whoa, what is this kid doing? when I was growing up. And there was pain involved in that. But God had a plan. And so I would tell you, God has a plan. And lastly, I'll tell you this. And this is for really everybody here. This is worth, worth the price of admission right here this morning. You need a set of priorities to live your life by. You need a set of priorities to live your life by. Look, don't be like the family who comes home from church on a day like today and what we're going to see here in a minute where they come home from child dedication and little Johnny in the back's crying and, and mom turns around and says, Johnny, why are you crying? She says, well, the pastor said, the pastor said that, 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 I, that I wanted to, to, to be raised in a godly home and I don't want to leave you guys. 
Don't be like that family. <laughs> Have a set of priorities. Some of y'all get that a little bit later. <laughs> Have a set of priorities that you live your life by. One of the things I do when, um, when I'm doing marriage counseling for couples that are about to get married is, is I, always, I always challenge them to set aside, have some family values. Have some family values. And so in our household, what that would look like is you say something like, we're carols, so we do this. One of them is, we're carols, so we go to church. Okay? We're carols, so we, we, we're generous. We give. Have a set of family values that you live by. And, and look, you can write them down. Some of them are probably understood, but I would encourage you, have a set of priorities that you live your life by. And so today is a great day to reflect. Today is a great day to look upon all these things in your life. Today's a great day to have a conversation with your kids about what you're thankful for and to share stories. And so I would encourage you today. Moms, we love you. Women, we love you. Whether you're a mom or not, understand, that's not where your value is. Your value is in being a daughter of the Most High, a daughter of the King. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, we thank you for today. God, I thank you for all the many blessings you've given to us. God, I thank you for the women that you put in our lives to teach us, to mold us, um, to, uh, to teach us how to, how to walk with you, to teach us how to uh, be your child. So God, today I pray we honor all the women in our lives, whether, whether they are our mother or not. Uh, I pray we honor them. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in your name we ask. Amen.